to the place where I am standing. All I want to do is get to where I'm going. This is the DIY Artist Route Podcast, a journey into what it takes to take our work to new people build our tribe of super fans and growth farm our projects to success in a variety of realms. I am D. Grant Smith, your guide for this route. I'm very much looking forward to sharing this part of the journey with you. This is a great conversation and definitely the longest episode of this podcast series. You will need to grab a pencil or pen and make sure that you can take notes. Our guest this time is Derek Webb, a fantastic blue-collar musician, singer-songwriter, and the founder of Noisetrade.com, a resource hub for musicians to build their superfan army. I've been using Noisetrade since its birth as a music discovery platform for the Appetizer Radio Show. I am currently using it to give away the first four chapters of my book, The DIY Musician's Radio Handbook. Go download the book sample at Noisetrade.com. Derek and I talk about the book in this podcast in a few ways because everything that I present in the book is in the mantra and method of what he has used to build his career. This stuff works, folks, and it will work for you too. So go grab the book, Sampler, right now. I do love backstories. I love learning about what happened with someone that led to the success that they have today, and Derek is a treasure trove of fantastic stories. He also is not shy about being honest about his growth. Success in this music space is about building your tribe. Seth Godin shared that with us on a previous episode of this podcast. Go download it if you missed that one. Derek is going to share similar ideas here and give you some excellent next steps to take to make super fan growth work for you. Are you ready to get started? Good. Lace up those shoes and let's hit the DIY artist route. I've, uh, I, I guess I kind of mentioned this a minute in the uh, email, but I've sort of followed your, you and your career for a very, very long time. And so when, oh man, when Chandler was like, hey, I want to introduce you to Derek Webb, I was like, holy crap, Derek Webb, really? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, yeah, I mean, it's a, I mean, it's a, the pleasure. It sounds like, it sounds like you've, you've uh, talked to much cooler people than me <laughs> from what Chandler was was telling me but uh how long have you been how long have you been doing the like interviews and and uh the thing that you're doing well um i've been working in in radio since i was a kid yeah um okay and but uh when from 2000 to 2013 i worked for a public radio station and uh that's hmm. that's where i got my my start in in media uh in 2003 i created a uh a variety music show called the Appetizer Radio Program, and um, mm-hmm. in 2008, uh, got some press from the Dallas Morning News, which is about two and a half hours away from where I live. Mm-hmm. And and um, a guy was passing through town. He heard my show, and he was like, "Man, this is just really awesome stuff. I I, I found a new artist I never would have heard of otherwise. Why is this wow. guy, Why is this guy not syndicated?" And and so my friend that that he wrote the article about messaged me and said, I don't know if you know this, but this guy in the Dallas Morning News is writing about you. And so I, I connected with wow. him. Wow. And, uh, and he was like, why Why can I not hear your show in Dallas? I want to hear it in Dallas. And I was like, uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, man. And, and, and he, he said, well, you need to figure out how to make that happen. And so that kind of got me started on wow. thinking about what syndication looks like. And at the time, there wasn't, like, now you can, if you've got, now if you've got a podcast or a radio show or anything, because it's so easy to record stuff and, and do things on your yes. own, there are all kinds of different, you know, syndication marketing services and people that will sell, you know, that kind of consultation. Yeah. And, and in 2008, that didn't exist. Or if it did exist, the, the people at the time were, that, that did that kind of stuff were very closed off. And so uh, right. yeah. I, I started, I started, just reaching out to my my list of contacts and trying to grow from there, and I did a lot of things the wrong way. And when I kind of hmm. circled back and realized, okay, what if I just approach people individually and try to make connections individually? And that worked. Mm-hmm. And so, in about two and a half years, we we've, we've gone from being just this little show in this little bitty town in Texas to being on like thirty something stations and eighteen stations. Yeah, wow. So, um, well, when you're when you're clearing and paving a path for the first time you don't know where the road is. So you, you know, like you don't know, 
the mistakes you're making as you're making them. I mean, you just you're just figuring it out. You're pioneering, so you don't you can't really blame the wandering um, too much. Well, I'm glad that you phrased it that way because that is perfectly in line with this podcast, which is the yeah. <laughs> DIY artist route. And so I, I just made a little note of that you have a great quote at uh, the time signature that that we're at. Now uh, I'll probably come back and ask you about that, but. Um, okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, to to I guess to to answer fully answer your question, um, I've mm-hmm. been doing this podcast for about six months. Um, I, Great. Okay. I, or maybe maybe a little long, a little longer than that. I started started contacting and talking with uh, Chandler last year. I love his email newsletter that he sends out. Just yeah, yeah. Such a smart articles. guy. Such a such a generous. You know, he's so generous with what he knows. Yeah. And, yeah, I love Chandler and Jay. Yeah, and and I I just recently connected with Jay. Uh, he's going to be a guest on on a episode coming up in a few weeks. Oh man, well he's he's phenomenal. Yeah, those guys are both so smart. You know. Yeah. So um, so Chandler and I have done a little bit of collaborative stuff together. Uh, but I, you know, I, I'm I I think we're all in the relationship business. It doesn't matter what what work you do or or what your job title is. Ultimately, you're you're in. Ultimately, we're all in, in two big industries. We're all in the relationship industry, and we're all, we're all in the customer service, people service industry. So, so making, yeah, making, right. making people happy and giving is is all of our jobs, and building on, yep. upon you know really strong, solid relationships and, and being personable is is all of our jobs. So, um, yeah, that's right. So all the all that to say that uh, yeah, th- this this side of things has been a really good opportunity for me to connect more one on one with people that I've always respected for a long time and be able to have just some really good conversations. So I appreciate you connecting with me, man. Yeah. Oh yeah. Pleasure, man. All right, Derek. Uh, man, you are the quintessential. This in my in my opinion and in reality, <laughs> you are the quintessential <laughs> indie musician entrepreneur. You've got a solo music career. You founded NoiseTrade dot com, which I can't help but praise at every opportunity I get to because I use noise trade in a variety of capacities, and I'm going to ask you all about that in a minute. Um, sure. To me, it's one of the best audience building music portals that's out there. I want to start asking you and start talking first with your solo music career. After being a songwriter for so many years, how has music changed for you, especially with how fans have changed in the way that they engage with songs uh, that have been around for such a long time? Yeah. Well, well, thanks for that. Thanks for those kind words. And it's a pleasure to get to talk to you. Um, you know, what's interesting is there, there's a few things I could say. One is that it is interesting to, I've heard people talk about songwriting and being a professional songwriter as being kind of a professional autobiographer. You know, you're kind of documenting as you go and you do it for long enough you start to get into this complication of having to play and emotionally connect with songs that you wrote, you know, 20 years ago when you were very literally, uh, a, a, like a different person. And like you're, so you feel like you're covering another man's music, um, which is very literally what you're doing. You do have to kind of find emotion, like things emotionally to grab onto, um, to put yourself in those moments um, and to, you know, and to be able to also stay out of the way of allowing uh, people for whom those songs matter a lot more than they might matter to you right this minute, the space to fill them with their own emotional furniture and not, uh, and, you know, kind of let go of them. And there's a point at which the things that you write kind of very quickly become public domain and you have to be willing to accept any interpretation as a right interpretation. Um, and where else in, but in art, is that really possible? Are, are there, can there be truly, can there be truly subjective meaning even to the, the, the maker of something? So it's like, that's been interesting, but the main thing that, it may, that your question makes me think of is that is what hasn't changed. You know, so I got my start in a band, in a Texas-based band called Cadman's Call. We were like a folk rock band down there. And I spent 10 good years in that band. And, and we started the band right out. I was right out of high school, so it was like 1992, I guess. And we started the band in 1993. And, and then I was in that band for about 10 years, till about 
2002 or so, I think, uh, which is right around when I put my first solo record out. And the years that I spent in that band, so the first half of our band's career was pre-internet. There was no internet yet. And then about halfway through, the internet happened, or, or just a few years in. And we... And what's fascinating is that, that, you know, my career to some extent has been a bit of a testament to how I've tried to navigate the, the evolving kind of landscape and the disruption that we've been feeling in the music space for more than a decade now. And uh, it, which touches on, you know, the, the story of how I started noise trade and a, and a few other things, but What's, what's fascinating to me as I look back is that the things that I learned in those first few years of being in Cademans about just the importance of, of, making, of making meaningful connections with your tribe, like finding, identifying, and meaningfully connecting with, your, with, that, with that small tribe of folks who, for whatever reason, deeply resonate with and get you and get what you're doing and what you're writing and want to be connected to and support what you're doing and finding those people and meaningfully connecting with them. And the, the things that we did in those first few years in an effort to do that when we were 19 and 20, we didn't know what we were doing. It wasn't a strategy. It wasn't something we thought about. It was an instinct. And I feel like those are still the same instincts I have today, 20 something years later, you know, it, which essentially was, we would, you know, and, and we would play the show. Well, first of all, when piracy, what, what is called, I'm using air, uh, finger quotes right now, <laughs> when piracy happened, you know, and that whole thing kind of started up and, you know, when music went digital and anything that can be free will be free. And when that all kind of started, um, everybody was like, you know, freaking out. And, but what I remember almost immediately is thinking like, what's everybody, what's everybody so upset about? Because like piracy, so to speak, was the only thing that, that my old band had going for us. That was the only way we could grow our career because, you know, we were an unknown band in Houston, driving, dri driving around Texas, just trying to make fans, get people to come out and listen to our music, trying to get discovered. And, you know, at that point, it was before the disruption, so there was really no musical middle class. It was all professionals, pe which means people who had record deals, who'd been signed, who like that very narrowest end of the funnel that very few people get through. That was the only people who were making a living at it and everyone else were just hobbyists. There was no, there was no, uh, blue collar version of that job. There was no middle class in music. It was just all people who got signed up at the head of the sales curve and then nobody. And so we were trying to make a go of it and we were trying to, you know, and we did wind up getting signed, which is the only way we survived at that time. That was the only access to the market was to get a record deal. And, so, but at the time, early on, you know, our instinct was like, we're just trying to get heard by people. We just want people to give us a chance. And so we were able to um, record some of our music, which at the time was a really hard thing to get done, but circumstantially it's its own story. But we, you know, we had some, we, we, the Plinko ball fell into our favor a few times and continued to for those early years. And we were able to get some music recorded and, and then we pressed them up on cassette tapes, which is, which was really kind of the main format at that point CDs were starting and, and we would go to these Texas colleges where our friends were in college. We were college age. We should have been in college, but we call our friends and <laughs> we would, we would drive to these different colleges with these boxes of cassettes of our music. And I think what we did, as I recall, is we would put three or four or five songs on one side that we'd recorded. And then like, we just kind of recorded a bunch of random interview stuff, like where we just kind of all talked and some of it was us just screwing around and some of it was, um, just us talking about why we were making music or what the music was about, what our kind of mission was, you know, like, um, and why we were doing it. And, and we put that on the other side. And so we make, we'd make them up and then we would go to the, to the place. And the only people who would come, cause there's no way your music did not arrive there before you arrived there physically. There was no internet. There was, there was no digital way to do it. So we would go there and our friend would gather, you know, we had friends at a lot of colleges in Texas. So they would gather a few friends. We'd have 15 people maybe. And, but, you know, there were like seven of us in the band. So, like, there would be as many people on stage as there were in front of the stage. And we would play our music. And then we would just get out all the cassettes of all the music for free. And we would tell everybody to please make as many copies as possible and give them to all their friends so that when we came back, 
more people would be there because they would have heard the interviews, connected with us, heard something about us, and maybe connected with our personalities, heard our songs. And that's what we did. We like we spent years doing that, we, and and that's how we built our career. And within a couple of years, we'd be able to go to a town, and we'd get hundreds of people to come out. And we literally got them one at a time, and we always encouraged them to make copies of our music and give it for free to their friends, because we knew that ultimately we were going to benefit from that being the way by which we the music was go was was the best marketing tool we had. So we figured let's set it free to go out and find our potential fans and bring them into our shows to connect with us. And even as we were making records in those early days and even well into all the, the major label records we made and, and actually every record I've ever made, look in the liner notes and there is always a statement in all the liner notes that says even after and during the, the whole piracy scare, we were always saying, and I was, I've always said like, please make copies of this music and give it to your friends. Like, please, please, please make copies. Like, um, you know, uh, ignore the FBI warning printed on the back. <laughs> I'm, I'm the, like, I am the copyright owner and I'm telling you to do it. Like, please do it. I mean, piracy was the only way we could make a living and, and, and grow our career. So, um, so something between that, the strategy of if it's good and you get it out there and you work with, you identify your fans, you empower them to evangelize for you. Um, and you continue to not break rule number one, which is be great. Be great's rule number one. You can't break that. It doesn't matter how good you are at everything else and social media and kissing babies and shaking hands. If you're not great, you just don't, you're not owed a career, you know, mm -hmm. like you're not owed a career. And uh, so if you're not breaking rule number one, if you can focus on empower your focus on find meaningfully connect with your fans, empower them, um, then you're going to, you know, you're going to, uh, move the needle. And, um, you know, we would play our shows and right before the last song, we'd say, Hey, everybody, like right after this, we're going over, there's 24 hour IHOP. We're going to be there in about an hour after we pack up, everybody come over. And then we'd go to IHOP. Even when we were playing in front of 2000 a night, we were doing this and we would, we would show up at the IHOP and it'd be Cademan's call party of 60 and we would take over the whole place and we would literally go around and meet every single person. Um, and uh, we would jump right off the front of the stage and start shaking hands and hanging out, talking to people. And the bus would be honking to get us to leave. And we'd be the last people in there. And, and like taking the time to really meet and connect with uh, and realize the importance of the role that those fans are going to play in your career. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the whole thing. And for us, and what's crazy is here I am 22 years later. And when I play in certain cities, there are, there are fans who sat with us in those IHOPs during those first couple of years in the early nineties who still come to my shows now, you know, like, and I know them and I know their families and I watched them get married and have children and, and they, me. And so it's like that that's, and what's funny is that's like the tunnel of truth that I feel like has been dug under all the disruption, all the technology, all the innovation. That's still, that's still the truest and, you know, most meaningful thing I've learned, I learned in those first few years, and that has kind of been my trajectory ever since. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I was I was thinking the whole time you were saying, like, you know, please break the FBI warning. I was like, this is Bizarro Lars Ulrich. Ladies and gentlemen, Bizarro Lars Ulrich. <laughs> right. Because, I mean, that, that yeah, is... Well, and, and we're both, and we're both, we're both short and, and loudmouth, so like, well, we are kind of a yin-yang. And yeah. as as much as I respect Lars as a drummer, I'm not sure about the uh, you know the I, I don't get I don't get the feeling of community and welcomeness that he presents as much as I get it from you. So uh, in a in a yeah. variety of ways, you are you are the opposite. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, and to be to be fair, you know they uh, you know I have a lot fewer fans than Metallica though. But you know I think that that also comes from you know he comes from kind of a place of luxury in the way that the grid through which he looks at the problem is completely different than mine. I mean, I see it as an opportunity to build something um, upon the rubble of the disruption, and he sees it as, you know, Humpty Dumpty that needs to be fixed and put back on the wall. So it's like, because that system has worked for him really well. Now, that system worked for me pretty well, too, but um, I think there's that fundamental difference of luxury that, like,
even though I've been on major labels my whole career, I've approached my career and run it very much like an independent. And, and I've been very much in control of my career, even, even the years I have been on major labels. But like you kind of, you don't have the luxury of leaving any resource unused. Like you have to use every part of the Buffalo, you know? And, and I, and I feel like also my career is essentially, um, essentially what I do in my career is I run a lemonade stand, you know, like every, every bad and, and prohibitive thing that I run up against, I have to learn how to, you know, use it. You know, I, I, I need to learn how to use judo on it and like, turn it upside down and use it as something to propel me. That's the only choice I have. And I think that's made me tenacious, you know, which is probably why 22 years later, um, never having had a hit of any kind on any format of radio and never having sold more than 20 or 30,000 records of any one record in my career, other than Cademan's records. That's why I still have a job, you know, 22 years later. It's not because I'm super talented. I've got friends who are way more talented than me at everything I do in music. I'm just really tenacious, you know, and I like, I just won't take no for an answer, you know, and I think that's, and I'm just not good at anything else. That's part of my story. Like I have, <laughs> like I, I have skills in so few areas. I'm, I'm, I'm only good at a couple, honestly, God, I'm only good at a couple of things and most everything else I'm horrible at. So, um, but, the, but I'm, I'm self-aware enough to know that, the few things I am good at, and they're very few, but those few things I'm super good at. Well, and so I want to, you know what I'm saying? So I want to yeah. spend all the time I can concentrated on using those few skills that I have, which has made me really tenacious. So, I mean, I think that's maybe the only thing I've got going for me. Well, you've got a lot more going for you than you realize, man. You're, you're, <laughs> well, you're, incre- you're incredibly humble, and that's, that's uncommon for someone that has done as much as you have. Um, but oh. I want to, I want to talk a little bit about noise trade. You've paved a really yeah. good, um, really good trek up to this point in terms of being able to, you know, identify that noise trade wasn't just this, you had this dream where you, where artists gave away their music for free and all they asked for was, was an email address and maybe this will work. Like you, you had, you had already proven that the, that the, the, the premise and the, the methodology behind it would be successful mm-hmm. even before, even before you started. But what, what I first got into no- when when did you start? That was it like two thousand eight, nine, something like that. It it was two thousand eight. Yeah, with the first okay. version of the site went up on in two thousand eight, so, July fourth, two thousand eight. So when you when you started, I I think I I found it right after you had just started it, and so I thought, holy crap, I can I can discover all this great music, and all I have to do is I I get I get to give somebody my email address. Does that mean that they'll contact me? Sweet, I get to be in contact with a band that I like, discover, <laughs> right. discover new music, and and learn something. So this was right around the time I was starting to do uh, more of the syndication stuff with the appetizer. I've since then I still and I don't use it as often as as I used to because so much music comes in the mail now um, for me. Yeah, but, but I still yeah. go it, you know once a month or so I'll, I'll go in and just kind of scour and one of the best mm-hmm. musicians that you have given me from noise trade is um matthew mayfield oh yeah Matthew, and, man. he's and, he's a, he's a buddy and he's a great artist yeah i talked to him a couple weeks ago he, Wait, so, you talk about a hard worker he's a yeah he's, he's got he's got a hell of a work ethic and he's really smart and he's talented you know yeah he told me that he told me that he's known you you guys for a while and, um, yeah, yeah. and but uh, when he put his whole record library on noise trade i'd never heard of him mm-hmm. before and it, it just took two or three songs where i was like who in the hell is this guy he is amazing mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know th- then you know looking him up and, and and having a conversation and realizing that we're actually both from the same town and um, all kinds of cool stuff. Wow. But but what what noise trade is for me, and I'm I'm such a, a big advocate. I talk about noise trade all the time on on the appetizer. Anytime I find it, an an artist or a, a series of music there, I always say, hey, this is where I found it. Go get it now. You can get it for free, or and you can tip the artists or whatever. But mm-hmm. but what what you're doing, what you've done, and what you've built, Derek, is incredible. But I want to know that I, I want to know if if in your mind when you were putting all this stuff together, if you realized that you were kind of in a way paving 
a course in a s- sense because now the mar- the main marketing way that everybody grows themselves is they have this lead magnet that they exchange and and I have it on my site too. Uh, we we exchange content for an email address and we're. T- I'm mm-hmm. trying to build a relationship and a connection with new people. Others are just trying to mm-hmm. use that as a way to market and sell stuff. But you, you, sure. you started doing that way before this was ever a marketing trend. So did you know that that was going to be a way for people to build connection with their fan base? Or what, what, what made you decide to go, okay, let's create a platform that gives music away for free, but all we mm-hmm. ask for is an email? Yeah, well, so I came into it pretty... Um, selfishly and organically. I mean, it was basically, I was just trying as a, as an artist. And at that point I was, you know, three or so years into my solo career, um, which was going okay. But I was basically just trying to solve my own problem. And the problem that I was having was that the label that I was on, which were, which was a great group of people, very supportive of me, you know, smart, great marketers, but I'm, I'm a, I'm complicated, you know, and so it's like the, the the music that I've made, and the records that I've put out, and the and the, um, the and the the and the the effort it takes to tell the story to connect what I'm doing to the market. It was just it was a lot of work, and 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 as hard as we would work, you know, I kind of had my base kind of tribe of folks who had followed me out of Cavemen and who um, had remained really supportive of me. Um, and, and so every time out, I mean, we could count on selling 15, 20, 25,000 records maybe. And, um, but it wouldn't matter if we sold, if we spent $10 or a hundred thousand dollars on marketing, we would sell exactly that amount. And so we had kind of gotten by that third record into this pattern of just budgeting to sell that, um, to where we could, you know, me and the label all kind of comfortably, were able to make that work. And, and, uh, so there wasn't really any ambition beyond, beyond that, those numbers. And that was fine with me. But my third record was a record called Mockingbird. And that record, for whatever reason, I just had a little extra ambition for that record. Like I, I just, I felt as though maybe, maybe cause it was kind of a, a little more of a political record and it just had some things on it that I, I just felt like we haven't told the story that this record hasn't found all of, the people yet who I think would really resonate with it. I think there are more people for this record, maybe just for this record, not for me as an artist, but for this record, I feel like, and how do we find them? Because we've spent all the marketing money. So the money that the attention we can buy didn't do it. It didn't accomplish it. And, um, you know, it was maybe six months into the record cycle. We had sold those 15, 20,000, whatever it was. We'd sold that many. So my tribe had it. My people bought it. The marketing money was gone. The sales were kind of trickling, which happens around, you know, three to six months. It's like when the initial surge is over. And, you know, I figure at this point, the record will sell 10 copies a year on iTunes for the rest of my life. And, you know, that's kind of it. You know, that's, that, that, you know, they, like it's out there. That's, and there was no more money to spend to spread the word any further. So the label, you know, met with me and said, you know, we're, we're, we need to start talking about record four. Like, let's, let's move on. And, and I pushed back just this one time. I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. Typically, that'd be fine. But I'm not, I don't know if I'm done with this record. I want to promote it a little more. I think there are more people who would resonate with it. And and the label said to me, rhetorically, I think, um, you know, unless you can come up with a way to promote the record that doesn't cost us any money, we, we have to move on. And so I went and thought about that. And my thinking was, that you got to remember, so 2006, as you kind of said, it was ludicrous to give music away. No, no one had done it yet. Like there was no model around it yet. Like Prince hadn't done it. Nine inch nails, uh, Radiohead. Nobody had given really music away for free. It, it was, it was crazy to do it. And, but my thinking was the people who are going to buy it have bought it. So now it's my best piece of marketing. Like it's my best, like, like now it's great use. Like not, not, nothing will persuade people better than the actual music. All the advertising in the world isn't as persuasive as actually hearing the music, realizing that you love it for some segment of the people who might hear it. And maybe it's a tiny segment, but that tiny segment is how I slowly build my tribe. You know, I, those are the people I'm looking for. And um, I'm not looking to get money out of people who are not my fan. In fact, I'd rather them hear it, not like it, and 
fantastic. I mean, like, great. So now we know that about each other. Go find something you do like. I mean, <laughs> I'm looking, you know, I'm looking for my fans, right? So I thought what I should do is um, we should give it away for free, but get um, emails and zip codes, emails and postal codes. Those, those are the two things that matter to you. Geo right. Yeah, because, that was that was the big but, thing. Right. I remember. Yeah, that because, now, because yeah. not yeah because not only not only did I want to have be able to connect directly with them, not have those customers wrapped up and those fans wrapped up in 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 social media or or, or um, an economic platform like iTunes. You know, th- th- those those platforms and those businesses they, they make their living like their whole business model is owning the customers and and standing in between the uh, two walls on one side are the creators and on the other side are the consumers and they basically own the relationships and they own your access to those people and I was thinking like you know I only had maybe four or five thousand people on an email list at that point which isn't nothing but I was thinking like if I could go directly to these fans and not have to go through iTunes, uh, not have to go through social media at the time, like the label would regularly spend five figures to basically rent a giant email list. It was just this giant list that was like probably bought and consolidated. And, you know, 0.401% of people would be interested in, but they would just spam out a bajillion emails to people. And they pay a lot of money for that. I was like, what if I had my own list that was like that, that I could go directly to um, and subvert iTunes and social media and everything else? And so I went to them and I said, hey, here's what I want to do. Would you guys allow me to give the record away for free online for three months for emails and postal codes? And then we'll use the data because the data to me, I, immediately I got the idea that the data is going to be so much more valuable even than the money because money is a finite resource. Like, um, and especially like, you know, anonymous dollars or pennies from iTunes, like money's fine. And, and there is a point at which you, it does need to become a revenue transaction. But for me, I was like, if I had the data, if I had the direct connection with these fans, I can make that data make me, that's a, that's a reusable resource. I mean, I, I would rather, rather than getting an anonymous $10, I'd rather get an email and a postal code and make $50 over the next five years with that. That's, that's an increase of what I'm making. And slowly but surely, I'm building my tribe. Um, that group of people who l- resonate so deeply with what I'm doing that they are glad to pay me and support me. Um, rather than making, trying to get people to give me money, you know, then you have a group of people who just need the opportunity to do it and they can't wait. Um, and they'll give you more than you ask for. So it's like, that was my thought. Is like, even... Um, and I think I had observed already, um, with some of my researching and just kind of the way my brain works that you really can't change people's consumption habits. Mm. We even knew that back in the mid two thousands, like you can't, um, and Radiohead certainly proved it when they did their in in rainbows, uh, campaign, because there were all these people. I mean, it was totally free. They gave it away for free. But it was still the number one record in the world, um, uh, according to Nielsen Soundscan, when it came out months later, because there were so many people who just didn't want to consume it that way. They just, they buy their things on iTunes. And so they were waiting for it to go to iTunes, or they buy their things in physical stores, and that's where they were going to go do it. Just because they don't want to do it the way that you want them to. They want to do it the way they want to. And you can't change those habits. So it's like, my suspicion was that we're not going to be poaching sales out of the physical retail. We're not going to be poaching maybe even sales out of the digital retail. This is a whole different group of people. You have to, you know, I had this strong instinct. So I said to the label, let me give it away three months, email postal codes, and then we'll use that to sell them the previous two records and the new record next year. And since they're geo-targeted emails, we'll promote all the tour shows because now we'll have, you know, we'll know where the fans are all over the country and we can segment them and we can promote directly to them. And there's a million ways we can make money with the data. But we, but I had just a strong feeling it was going to work, and persuaded Sony Columbia to let me do this. And I think it's because I had never, I had not sold many records to them that when it got passed up the chain, they were like, "Who is this? Is he even on our roster? Like, we don't know who he is. Sure, let him do whatever he wants." Um, if I'd been really popular and sold a bunch of records, there's no way I could have had the opportunity. So my lack of success has been my greatest success. And so, uh, <laughs> and yeah, and and so. I, so we did it. And for three months, we gave it away, email, postal code. It was a brand new record. Um, I went initially to my fans, those four or 5,000 people and said, Hey, 
don't take for granted that your friends know my music. And those people who you've been trying to get to listen to it, this is the perfect opportunity. Send them here to download it for free. Um, and download it again yourself because I don't want to take for granted. I'd love to extract your information out of iTunes. Like if you, if you guys have been buying it online, you know, I would love to make sure I have that we're connected. And so that's what I did. That's how we approached it. I had a few friends and bands who had bigger tribes than me who I got to kind of mention it to their tribes during those three months. And in three months time was managed to give away like 80,000 records. And for me, that was huge. It was a game changer. Um, and, you know, so suddenly at the end of three months, I'm sitting on 80,000 geo-targeted, you know, emails um, of all these people who did this. And so first of all, it worked. But that um, is actually not where Noise Trade was born. Noise Trade was, was born at the next step, which was at that point, I'm thinking, okay, all I managed to do was give away a whole bunch of records you know, and, um, and maybe lose a whole bunch of money. Although I did think to myself, the op like there's almost a zero opportunity cost because people who download it and don't like it and delete it, I never would have gotten their money anyway. So that's mm -hmm. a total break even. But the people who have not found it yet, which means our best efforts and all of our money and three years of the solo career, 10 years previous has not found those people. We've not gotten into those radars. If this was the way that we found each other, um, then that, then that is, that is found money. You know what I'm saying? That's like, those are found fans at that point. So it's worth it. Cause that means now I've got new people. That's like lead generating into selling them everything else I have, um, which they've just discovered. So that's going to be great. So, but what we did, the first thing we did was we looked at the data that we gathered, um, 80,000 and filtered it by zip code. Cause I really wanted to know what we could learn from it in terms of where these people are, who they are, and, and something fascinating we realized, and that was in the five cities where I'd given away the most records um, during those three months, um, two of them I had never played a show in as a solo artist, which were Los Angeles and New York. Because I, I am a niche, 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 niche folk singer. You know, I don't have any business going to competitive markets like that. I stick, I stick in, the, in the South and the Midwest. I don't go to those. But here's this data. It says, for instance, I remember Los Angeles, some, within 20 miles of downtown Los Angeles, something like 2,200 people had downloaded that mm, record. Wow. And so it's like a huge concentration of fans. I've got to go out there and play a show. It doesn't make any sense because I don't think I would do well in that town, but I, here's the data. Um, so let's try it. So I called my, my uh, guy who helped me with booking at the time and I said, okay, I need you to book me any show in any venue on any night for any pay in Los Angeles, anything. I'll take a bank opening. I mean, just give me anything. <laughs> and so he came back and he booked me a Wednesday night, horrible, a Wednesday night um, at a venue called the Knitting Factory on Hollywood Boulevard um, for a zero guarantee, but 90% of the door. So I wasn't going to make any money unless people showed up. And then I would make money, but it was all a gamble on me. And it was in their downstairs bar, which didn't even usually have music on a Wednesday night. I think it was a favor. So they weren't losing anything. I mean, the bartender's going to be down there anyway. They don't care if I'm playing down there. Um, and I think it held about 100 people. Um, so I took it. And then what we did was we filtered the list, segmented it, and said, okay, just the fans within 20 miles of that venue, which, again, was about 2,200 people, we're going to email them. And we're going to say, which is what we did. And we said, Hey, hope you love the record. Thank you so much for downloading it. Um, in, in two weeks, I'm going to be in your town. Please come out to the show at 10 bucks at the door. And then two days before the show, we hit him one more time. Hey, just a reminder. Hope you love the record. Please come out 10 bucks at the door, knitting factory. No idea what was going to happen. So I flew out there, um, did my sound check, walk around, got something to eat. And so my buddy and I are walking up and the thing about the knitting factory. So there's the room I'm playing in which is barely a venue, but it's holds about a hundred people in the, in down in, downstairs. Then there's a mid-sized venue in the middle and holds about 400. And then there's the big venue, which holds thousands. And that's like where the big artists would play. And it was a really cool venue. A lot of cool people play there. So we're walking up to play the show. I'm walking up to play the show. And there's this line down Hollywood Boulevard to get in the name factory. And my buddy, I said to my buddy, literally, man, I wonder who's playing the big room tonight. Apparently somebody really cool. Maybe we'll sneak into that show when mine's done. And we get up there. And I remember walking up, and as we were pushing the door, people started like cheering and stuff. And I was like, "What's going on?" And I got up there, and they were all there to see my show. 
Wow. And we couldn't believe it. And the Mega Factory couldn't believe it. They were like, who the hell are you? And, and I, are you famous? And I was like, no. And that's why this is meaningful that we pulled this off because this, this was not a lightning strike. We did this with data. Like, we could do this again, and we could do it in 20 cities. Um, this was just one of the biggest ones. But we could do a scale version of this. And if you've got 200 people who will come to see your show in 20 cities, you've got a career for the rest of your life is, is how that works. So, so, I, so, I, I, so we sold the, the room out at 100, sold it out, turned away like 200 people on the street, which I told them to wait. I played the show for the people who got in, went out on the sidewalk, played a second show for the people who didn't. The Knitting Factory booked me that night to come back six months later for a guarantee in the next bigger room, which I did and sold it out six months later. And I did exactly the same thing in New York at the bitter end, exactly the same drill. Line around the block, who the hell are you? Turned away to pass you the room. <laughs> I mean, it was exactly the same thing. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh my gosh, I think we just demystified this. I mean, I, I, like, it changed my career overnight. So it's like, and I had glimpsed that we had backed into a solution that was bigger than just my use of it. And so my first thought walking away from, from those gigs was, I have so many friends who are at my level, uh, blue collar kind of musicians who I know would be more than willing to give away a little bit of content in exchange for information with which they could make a living. I know they would do it, but they're not going to think of it. It's 2006. Um, so it took us two years. Um, we bootstrapped it. We paid for it ourselves. No one would give us any money because there was no revenue model. We just knew it was going to work like crazy. And then in 2008, you know, me and, and three friends of mine all put up a little tiny bit of cash, got the initial version of the site up, which did exactly what I did. I mean, like it allowed artists to come upload music they wanted to give away for free and facilitated the trade of email postal code for, for content. Um, it, it was automated. It didn't require us running it. It just kind of sat there and worked. We put it up in 2008 with a, maybe a dozen records on it, which were all friends who I convinced to do it, who all thought it was crazy, but did it anyway, because I just wouldn't stop hounding them about it. Um, and now, you know, here we are almost eight years later, um, still bootstrapped, still run it ourselves, uh, founder run and owned. And we've got, you know, 35,000 artists on the site. We've given away more than 10 million albums in our eight years, um, full albums. We, we give away a quarter of a million albums a month, every single month. And, um, you know, we, we launched Noise Trade Books um, maybe almost two years ago. We've got a couple thousand authors and independent Publishers giving away ebooks and audio books. We want to make a move into film this year. We've got a ton of filmmakers asked to distribute their film with this model, which would, uh, which you know, that, that's kind of the third wave of disruption after music, then book publishing, and then film is kind of how it's trending. So we're looking at that. And but but the best part about it is that we have put some real effort into curating and featuring content that we think is great. And um, so we've got like a million and a half, million point six or seven people on an email list who we speak to three times a week and carefully curate some featured content. Um, and they trust us and they come in so we can really jump in behind artists and really help build, um, tribes to them, you know, and, and we take that curation really seriously. And so that's kind of how we got here. You know, that's, I know that was a super long answer, but, <laughs> no, this is but that, that's, that's, the, that's not only the whole story, but it's also the logic behind why, why you would do this. You know, yeah. awesome. No, I there's probably some clicking sounds in the background. I'm just saying that for for the the listeners. Uh, who are like, <laughs> what, what is that background noise? I I take notes. I take diligent notes all the time. And yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you you've you've said these very powerful things that I'm going to go back and reference in a, in a bunch of other capacities outside of just this podcast. So I'm I'm taking notes as as and I can't help it that that. Apple hasn't made a clickless. Um, no, 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 no. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you'll probably have to edit me considerably. Maybe this will be a three-parter. <laughs> you, you, uh, you answered actually a question I was going to ask you. I was curious if you were going to go into the indie film route because mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. because there's so much stuff that's there now. When you when you added um, when you added book publishing, mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm guessing that's because you're a you're a reader and pro I, I don't know if you've written any books. So possibly you have. No, no, no! I could never. Yeah. Uh, I wrote a, a book uh, recently that'll be published in May. Um, that's all about uh, how DIY musicians can get uh, targeted specific radio airplay and essentially really build their media contact list 
for the exact same reasons that you mentioned a minute ago, and I, I, that was one of the things I was clicking when I was writing down, uh, when, you, when you said that, that the label has this gigantic contact list that they're spamming to their, their contacts and they're not actually like messaging people specifically for certain reasons. And mm-hmm. so when, I'm, when I was telling you earlier a little bit my, my backstory with the appetizer, when I was doing things the wrong way, I was doing exactly that because that's what had been done for me. And I figured, well, if all these big labels are doing this stuff, this must be what works. And I don't know, right. how, I don't yes. know, I don't know how they're able to get traction doing things that way. Maybe they would do things – maybe they get something from that, that list. But if they – and what, what, I, what I advocate and, and show people how to do in the book is if you will go individually – and be specific about the stations that you target and be specific about the people that you're trying to reach and be specific about the audience. Like, just like what you said, you, you, you want to go after your fans. You don't care about what people think that, that don't necessarily have an interest in what you're doing. Um, right. I'm not trying to get money out of my non-fans. Right. I'm just trying to connect with my actual fans. Right. Because so, I'll get there. Because if you, if you download my music and for free and you turn out to be, you love it and you're, you're a fan, rest assured, I will get your money. And I don't just mean like I'm going to come and make you get it from the church. Like, <laughs> like I will get, I will get your money if you, if like you know, like you, you will, we will eventually, like that, 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 that will happen. Now, so I'm not looking for my non-fans. I'm not trying to get money from anybody or or get support from anybody who uh, who isn't really a fan of my music. I'm not trying to trick anybody into giving me money. I'm just trying to find the people for whom the the, the stuff is so resonant. Right. That it's like Amanda. It's like Amanda Palmer says. Like, yes. If you really, if you really connected well and you found your real tribe of people, it's not a matter of trying to get their money. It's a matter of giving them, giving, giving them opportunities to give you their money because they can't wait to, and they'll, they'll give you more than you ask for. Yes. Exactly. Um, exactly. So you, yeah. That's it. So, so that's exactly. I mean, that that is, and your your Amanda Palmer quote is perfect because her book, The Art of Asking, was a life changer for me. It's so good. Um, it's so good. Yeah, she's a pioneer. Yeah, I do. Yeah, she's been on Noise Trade, and and um, yeah, we so we've 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 communicated a a, a good you know a little bit. So yeah, you should talk to her. Like uh, you should definitely get her on here. I, I do want to get her on here. I don't. I've got a friend that knows her, but but she she's she's kind of cautious about reaching out, and because I know that that Amanda is somewhat anti-radio, and I have every like agreement with her on why she is that way. Um, right. So, so you know, me, me reaching out and saying, "Hey, I'm a syndicated radio host," can come ac- come across as, "Oh, you're one of those guys that's trying to exploit me," and I don't want to do that. She may be anti-radio, but she's definitely very uh, pro generosity with knowledge like she 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 wants people to have all the best information and she wants people to know what she knows you know like so she she definitely is um you know so i so i think that would probably uh, supersede right. whatever well, negative feeling she has about radio i don't know if i would ever use like I, I don't use any of these i don't use any of these segments in in the show because the show is all music and it really it's it, it's 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 really wild, man. Um, I remember as you were talking about the data. Uh, one of the things that when Chandler and I were first talking, he's like, "You really need to talk to Derek Webb because Derek is all about how data is more valuable than money." And I was like, "Oh yeah, hundred percent, yeah." So, um, well, because I yeah, and well, and and the and the the, the 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 statement that is usually the thing that will get the conversation going, and this is totally true. And, I, and I've already talked about. I don't have to. It, it makes sense to get in the conversation we've already had, but like. I make more money giving music away for free than I made selling music the old way, like by by three or four times. So what? What? So what this, you, what, this, what this you, is not just a move of desperation. This is actually better business. You know. Well, okay. Let, let me ask you a strategy question then. In 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 the interest of giving away free information, what I think that I think that's part of the learning curve too, because people understand, okay, I can give this stuff away and I can build these connections with people, but they don't necessarily know, you know, Amanda's brilliancy of the art of asking. What so so at mm-hmm. what at what point do you get to, and what does it look like? I think that's that's really the cl- the crystal clear question. What does it look like mm-hmm. for you to get to the place where you're like, okay, I have this connection with this group of people as my fans. They've downloaded my music. I know where they where they live in a zip code geographic area. My next step in getting them to give me their money because I will get your money, quote unquote, from Derek. Wood. Yes. So what is what is, what what are the steps and what does that look like to make that happen? 
first of all, it has to come back to rule number one, which is be great. You know, you can't, none of this works if you're breaking rule number one. You can be great at rules number two through ten, but if you're breaking rule number one, it, the, the rest of the dominoes, um, you know, the first one doesn't touch them. So it's like, you, you know, so it's, so you have to really put a lot of effort into your craft and making really, really great and resonant stuff. And if you're doing that and you have found the, you know, the folks who uh, are resonant with it and love it, want to support it, I think that it's kind of like falling in love in the way that the more that you pursue it as an idea, as opposed to the person with whom you want it, you'll sabotage it. Like, I think it takes more pursuing the, the relationship with these people without regard to how you'll get their money is ironically how you'll get their money. Like, the, the, the support and the, the financial support that comes from the tribe you've gathered is really a fruit of the work, not the end all point of it. And right. so it's like, for instance, when people do noise trade campaigns and they do really well and, you know, they, they give thousands of, of uh, records away or, or, or uh, EPs or whatever they're, whatever they're giving away, and they come away, and I've seen some artists, I think, do this um, not the right way, necessarily, in my opinion, which is they immediately want to uh, cash in. They're like, okay, I've got these people. Now I need to email them and say, here's every way you can pay me. And I think you might make a few conversions. I think we'll get a lot of unsubscribes. I don't think that's necessarily... Um, because the point of the relationship can't be to make money. If, if you just want to make money, there are a lot easier ways to make money than trying to be a blue collar artist. Let me just say that <laughs> there are a lot of easier ways. If money is really the thing you care the most about. If, if being a great storyteller, if, you know, wanting to put effort into making resonant art for people for whom it will be a soundtrack of their emotional lives is the point, And you want to make a living at that but the money is not the end all be all for you. Oh, then I think there's just nothing but opportunity for you. And so, um, what I've seen work a lot better is uh, after a really successful noise trade campaign, when you're sitting on all this fresh data, you don't really know what to do. Take a minute and let maybe your first interaction with those people be like gratitude and be like, Hey, thanks for, I'm so glad we found each other. And I hope you love the record. And like, maybe here's, um, a blog that I wrote this year with a little more of my story, um, and a little context about the record I'm working on right now. And, and maybe here's other places to follow me and get, you know, and to get for us to get more connected and let that be your first interaction. Like continue to make the investments into the, into the relationship and the fruit will come from it. It's, it's the same thing as saying like, if you pressure a girl to love you, you're going to do the opposite of make her love you. But if you pursue her with no regard to where it's going, it's likely, it's, it, you know, to, to go there. And so it's like, but you definitely don't get there pursuing the idea. You only get there pursuing the relationship. So it's like that to me. Um, and so here's a great example. Um, and then I'm going to stop monologuing, but a great <laughs> example is, um, so the band fun, um, we've worked with them a handful of times and they're a tremendous, you know, uh, kind of pop rock band, you know, and they've had a huge couple of, you know, years in the last few and, and, you know, they came to us, um, and we got behind a, we've done two or three campaigns with them. Um, but, but initially when they were building momentum and they were already, you know, doing really well, but they came to us to maybe to lead generate for a tour or a new album. I forget exactly, but maybe they put a sample. I forget what the first thing they did with us was, but, they put something up. It did really well. Um, you know, they got a bunch of folks, um, even, even fans they already had, even the people they weren't making new fans necessarily, what they were, what they were doing is they were extracting data out of a huge fan base that only knew them from the radio and from soundtracks and none of whom they had any direct connection with in terms of actually being able to go directly to sell and to promote things, emails, you know, zip postal codes. So, it was, so that was an effort that they made and it worked really well. So then later that year, at the end of that year, 
is when they won the big Grammy. Like they, you know, that was their big moment. And, um, they were just for a minute, they were like the biggest band in the world. And, um, and we thought, cause we've seen this before and we love playing any role in any stage of an artist's career from early days to, you know, legacy artists. But we thought to ourselves, well, that's the last we'll see of those guys. I mean, I'm, we're so happy for them, you know, and I'm, we're so glad to play at any part in their story. And amazingly, they understood that if you have a moment where you're that whale and you're up out of the water for a second and you're all the way up out of the water, you're not going to stay there for very long, but you've got a minute up here where you're up out of the water. They were smart to basically not cash in in that moment, to not let that be the moment where they basically took their chips off the table and just tried to extract whatever money they could out of the, the, the people who were paying attention to them at that moment. So rather than um, kind of, kind of, you know, take their chips down, they, they actually doubled down on their investment. And what they did, because they knew that they had the world looking at them for a minute. Everybody was looking at this band and talking about this band. And so rather than doing a big sale or trying to sell something to everybody, they came back to us. And they said, we want to do a, another campaign, like a sampler. Or we want to do like a, so they put together this great bit of content for us. And they, rather than asking for everyone, now these are not, fan, I'm talking about like all the new fans that were paying attention because of the Grammys and because of their big moment they had that year. They went, you know, to everywhere they could promote things, Facebook and everywhere. And um, basically said, we don't want you to pay us right now. We want to give you more. We want to connect more with you. And so everybody go download. We've got, it. We're, we've got basically an exclusive thing we've put together for free and we want everybody just to have it. And, and, so they used their big moment up out of the water, that big whale up out of the water. They used their moment to actually connect more deeply rather than to get money because they knew if they did a good job at that, the money was going to definitely follow. And, um, and so they, that's what they did. They gave away a ton. I mean, it was so great. Like it, it did really well. And all these people who were kind of following them and had just kind of discovered them and, um, and heard about them because of the Grammys, downloaded all the, you know, this free stuff from them. And then when that moment for them was over and that big whale was back down in the water again, you know, um, and the big spotlight moment that only one band at a time can occupy and not for more than a few months. Once that was over, they actually got out of it with a ton of new, they like, it's like they dug tunnels under the commercial machine and they, even though their moment was over, they still had all these connections with all these people because they'd given them something in exchange for their information. And so now those guys have a ginormous, um, you know, uh, geo targeted email list and they can play in any city in the United States and put thousands of people in a room, um, because they've got a direct connection with their fans. And I think that's a great, they were a great example of the right way to handle a moment like that. So whether it's the first moment after you do a big campaign and it's your first approach or if you're fun and you're the biggest band in the world for a second, um, uh, meaningfully connecting um, and, and, and owning the relationships with those people yourself is always a smart move. And I just think that's a great example of it, you know? Wow. Dude, thank you so much for sharing that story and for, for sharing all these stories. You've, you've given me such... I, think that's, <laughs> I know, I'm such a talker. I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. Please don't apologize. No, it's... it's it, you have covered so much great stuff here in in you know in building. And we've we've been talking about different people that that both you and I are fans of. Seth Godin is one of the you know best advocates for great storytelling, and you've told some incredible yes. stories that uh, that shine such a great light into the not just the backstory, but in in you telling your backstory, you're revealing all of these great ideas that in in the pre internet days is where some of mm-hmm. the best best strategy and best ways to build connection can be utilized now here in the internet age because it's so uncommon to do things previous to mm-hmm. the way that, they, that they're done now. So um, yeah. th- thank you thank you yeah. so much. This has been really awesome. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It was great to talk to you. Derek Webb, musician, tribe leader, and the founder of Noisetrade.com. Learn more about Derek, follow his music, and get plugged into his community at DerekWebb.com. Web is spelled W-E-B-B. He's also the founder of Noise Trade, a great resource for musicians to build strong connections, 
with the people who are truly in love with what you do. If you are a musician, this is a great resource. If you are an author and want to get some traction for your book, this is also a great resource. Speaking of, my book, The DIY Musician's Radio Handbook, which gives you a step-by-step process of growing your audience and building your network through radio and media coverage, is now available at noisetrade.com as a sampler. Go grab it. We also referenced Jay and Chandler Coyle of Music Geek Services, two past guests here on the podcast. Jay and Chandler do networking the right way, and you should definitely get plugged into what they do at musicgeekservices.com. You heard me taking notes during this conversation. There are a whole lot of great things Derek showed us here, including a strategy for building your superfan army, how to best use noise trade, why data is more valuable than just money alone, how keeping rule number one is vital, and why focusing on the relationship with your fan base is the most important thing that you can do to build your audience. That is growth farming, my friend. Want to know more about how you can do just that with your audience and how you can incorporate social media, music industry influencers, radio, blogs, podcasts, and more into that growth? Good. Contact me. Details are at dgrantsmith.com. And you can email me directly, dgrantsmith at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you this week. Our theme song does come from my good friend Timothy Palmer, his half-boy EP. It is a song called Tryin'. What we love and connect with, we share with our friends. I want you to do your part on this journey. Go tell three people about this podcast episode and send them to iTunes, Spreaker, or Podbean to subscribe download and gain a wealth of insight on the DIY artist route. You can also share my website link dgrantsmith.com which has this podcast and a whole slew of free information and resources just for musicians and creative builders like you. Thanks for trekking with me once again. We will pick up this next time with a new journeyman to teach us more about how to grow as artists and creative entrepreneurs. I am D. Grant Smith. I will see you next time right here on the DIY Artist Route.